The kingdom of heaven is like unto. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Before our Lord's time and during our Lord's time, parables were certainly a common teaching tool in Judaism and indeed in the East. Our Lord's hearers would have understood this format. There was nothing mysterious about it. And it makes sense. It's a useful format. It's, if we can say, it's familiar. It's friendly. This thing that we don't know about is like this other thing that we do know about. Today we talk about mustard seeds, yeast, bread. So it's familiar, but it's also a format that requires the hearers to do a little thinking. If there didn't have to be some thinking done, I could just tell you what it's like and we'd understand it. But I can't quite. It's hard to explain. It's like, it's like this, but it's not. That's the parable. It's not clear from the Gospel if this is the first time our Lord used parables. Probably not. Maybe He started using them much more frequently today or perhaps more complicated from here on out. It's not really that, that big a question for our purposes. Let's pull back just a little bit and consider these two aspects of parables that we just spoke about. This, this common reference point. This is friendly. It's familiar. We get it. And the fact that we have to pay a little bit of attention. Let's look at the way our Lord used it today. Small as a mustard seed was actually a common phrase in the Holy Land and it was used by the rabbis. It was, it was a common phrase in teaching. So you have this little bitty thing that everybody has experienced with, a little seed. You put it in the ground, you go away, you come back, you've got a big plant. It gives shade, it has branches, there are birds. It's nice. We've all seen this, we all know it. It's friendly, it's comfortable. A little thing can do big things, just like grace. That's what these parables are about, the workings of grace. This is easy. Or we look at the yeast. You put yeast into bread, put it in a nice warm oven, walk away, you come back the next morning, the house smells like grandma's. It's nice. It's comfortable. It's easy. Everybody knows this. It's like grace. It's something hidden that transforms the whole. It works whether we know it or not, and it transforms things. We can understand that. But again, I want to insist, if we have to use a comparison, it's like this. We all know this, but, but it's not. It's, it's not quite like this. We have to do a little bit of thinking. I'd like to speak about that part, because this is usually where we run into the problem. Let's let's look at our understanding of grace. And we have to understand that God's ways are not our ways. Whenever we speak about grace, the supernatural reality, very soon we will be stuck saying things, well, it's like this, but it's not. But it's like this. There are certain connections to to the natural world, to our natural lives. That's why the parables work with grace. The problem is that grace is supernatural. It's from God. And it's meant to get us to God. And by our own powers, we can do nothing to earn it. It's a divine reality. There are plenty of of sermons and books on grace, conferences. The sermon is not about that. So just to make sure that we're all speaking about the same thing, let's just define right now quickly grace. It's the life of God in our souls. And it's how he wants to work to sanctify us so that we can be with him in heaven. That's it. It's the life of God in our souls. It's God working in our souls. 
really the sermon is more about why it's so difficult for us to understand how grace works. And there won't be any clear-cut conclusion or or instruction that makes everything clear. This isn't that kind of topic. It's going to be a suggestion, though, that perhaps we need to guard ourselves from the tendency that we have, it's not that we might have, that we have, to reduce God and the workings of God to our level, to the ways that we would work. Really, it's a call to to remain in humility, understanding that we'll spend the rest of our lives trying to understand grace and its workings. And I want to, truly, I want to insist on this point. We must become students of grace. Here at the seminary, you'll get the definitions, you'll get all the distinctions, you'll have what you need from the classroom, but it won't be sufficient, not with grace. With these supernatural realities, what we need are the experiential understandings. And we gain those by the mistakes we make and the failures that we suffer. There is no way around it. These things are too profound, they're too high, they're too important to not learn by mistakes. They're too different than we are to not make mistakes in trying to understand them. We don't like that so much. We didn't come to the seminary to make mistakes. We didn't come to the seminary to feel, I don't know how this works. But it is why we came to the seminary. It's what we mean when we say we have to allow ourselves to be formed. We came to the seminary to die so that our Lord Jesus Christ can live in us. It's what it feels like. It doesn't feel comfortable. But it's critical because if we are meant to be ordained to the priesthood, then we are meant to be the men of grace in this world. We are meant to be the vessels that carry the eternal priesthood of our Lord Jesus Christ. It has to be his. We have to die to ourselves, and we we cannot afford the luxury of pretending, of imagining that God works the way we do, that God places the same importance on the the same things that we do, that God thinks it the way we do. He does not. But it takes some experience to start to have an understanding of that. It's critical for the faithful as well. Grace is working all the time, everywhere. When we start to feel ourselves becoming anxious, it's a good possibility that we've forgotten God's ways are not our ways. Grace is still working. Where is God? Where am I? Take a breath and we keep proceeding we'll always have to move through uncertainty. We'll always have to move through failures. It's the path that our Lord marked out for us. It's what he meant when he said, if you want to follow me, take up your cross every day. Let's look at simply one statement about the workings of grace. We hear it frequently. We hear that grace builds on nature. It's really one of the statements that we make to separate ourselves from the Protestants. It's a, multi, it's a multifaceted statement. Usually what we understand it to mean is that we have to teach our children basic virtues. For instance, this is a, this is a good one. We really do have to teach our children when they run into something that they don't, they don't understand or they don't know what to do next. They need to stop, and they need to think, and then they need to decide. And if they make a mistake, they need to learn how to deal with it, move on, and adjust. We have to teach them that. 
So when we say that grace builds on nature, what we mean is that if on the natural level, as we grew up, we learned that, and it's a habit, it's going to be much easier for the supernatural vir virtue of, let's say, prudence or faith to operate. Because we'll have the habit of stopping and considering what needs to be considered in the light in which it needs to be considered. Prudence just means, what do I need to do here and now in the light of eternal principles? That's how prudence works. Faith. How, what sort of sense, how do I judge that God is working even though I can't quite see how He's working? Right? St. Paul, faith is in things unseen. So obviously we have the dogmas and doctrines of our faith, of course. But we also have to operate by faith often. And it, it can be in darkness. It can feel awfully uncertain. But if we haven't developed that habit of thought, how will we do that? It makes it much more difficult. God can still work, of course. It's just going to be harder for us. There are many other examples. This is, this is, on, on this level, it's easy. If we don't teach our children to be polite, well, really, it's going to be harder for them to practice charity. It'll be harder for them to understand putting themselves beside, aside, and choosing someone over themselves. If we don't teach our children how to bear discomfort, how will they practice fortitude, all of these things? But this, this one's easy. So, good habits are certainly helpful. Good habits are helpful. We fall into the trap, though, of thinking that grace means that God is just going to be really, really happy with my good habits, and it's just going to be this invisible thing that makes them just right. We do have that, that mistaken notion. It's not true. So perhaps another, sorry, perhaps another comparison will help us understand this a bit more. There are many distinctions to be made in grace. Let's not worry about them. One of the things that grace does, it takes our goods, our virtues, our talents, whatever we have, and it elevates them to a completely different level, to the supernatural level. It makes them pleasing to God. You've heard me give this example before and develop it in, in various ways. This is just more of a reminder for those of you who've heard it before, and for those of you who haven't, it's, just a, it's something to consider on our own. Imagine that we walk into a kitchen. We see a small child, three or four years old, and they are standing at the base of the counter, and they know that there are cookies on top of the counter, and they want the cookies. And they're jumping as hard as they can, and there's just no way that that child is going to reach the top of the counter, much less climb up onto it and get to the cookie jar. It's not going to happen. We come up behind them, and at the top of their jump, we put our hands on their sides, we lift them up, we scoop the cookie jar towards them, take the top off, realize, oh, that's, those are peanut butter cookies, this kid is allergic to peanut butter, put it away, get the chocolate chip, bring it over, let him reach in, and enjoy a cookie. Seems like we did all the work, and... We did, actually. But notice, here's the point. Again, grace. It's like this, but it's not. It was the intention and the effort of the child that started this whole process. We just came and added something that was beyond their power. That's it. So... It's difficult to talk about grace because really even the, the intention and the jump of the child, the effort, that was grace as well. But let's not, everything's grace. But these are just images. We have to understand. These are just images. But to the degree that we helped that child get that cookie, infinitely more, infinitely more, does God make our acts virtuous on the supernatural level. To that degree, are the things that we're so proud of nothing in the sight of God. He's not even in the kitchen. They're not even in the kitchen. 
There's nothing that registers with him, if we can speak that way. It's not even on his radar screen. The things that we try to do with the right intention, offer ourselves to him, let him elevate, those are pleasing in the sight of God. But also, last, last image, last comparison. One of the, so this is difficult enough, right? Because we like our talents. And we don't like so much to have to turn them over to God and say, well, yeah, this is really, really great, but it's actually not good enough and really it's not worth anything. We don't like that. That's a, that's a problem. Here's another problem, though. We like to figure out all of these things out. We think that the faith should make things absolutely crystal clear. I should have clarity and certitude because of my faith. Well, to a certain degree, it's true. It's absolutely true. We know the things that we know by faith. There is absolute certitude. Nevertheless, once we start trying to put them in practice, things do get uncertain in the day-to-day practice of our faith. Part of it is not just with faith, but when we're looking at grace. The rules are different in the life of grace. In a real spiritual life, the rules are different, but they look the same. It's it's really a lot like this thing, but it's not. Let me give you an example. Imagine a single person by themselves, own house, own schedule, own everything. Imagine their morning getting up on Sunday and going to Mass. Nice, get up at a reasonable time, have a cup of coffee, maybe do a little bit of reading, do whatever we do, stroll to the car, get in the car, nice leisurely drive, come to Mass. Nice. Right? Getting up, Sunday, going to Mass. Imagine the same thing for a mother of 12. It's the same thing. We're getting up, getting ready to go to Mass. But it's nothing like it. It's the same reality, but absolutely different. Grace is more different than that. So we want to think that grace is the nice, neat, ordered thing, the single person drinking their coffee with the sun streaming through the picture windows. Really, the way it plays out is... Twelve children screaming, shoes lost down the toilet, and we're late. We're going to be late. That's actually at least how it feels on our end. Truly, huh? we don't like it. It's funny when we say it that way, but when we say it, look at our Lord on the cross. It plays out. If we're following the promptings of grace, it's friendly, it's nice. Birds in a tree and, and grandmother's bread. And it's terrible, and it's awesome, and it is meant to annihilate us so that God can live in us. And how do we get there? Through the crucifixion. Only grace can help us to understand that. That's why we don't like it so much. We want to stay with the bread and the coffee with the picture windows. And that's our plan. It's not necessarily God's plan, though. We have to follow His plan. So it's a difficult thing. I said, it's, it's an experiential knowledge. Read all the books you want. It's not going to get you anywhere. As a matter of fact, what we do when we read books or essays or hear sermons on grace, actually we tend to hear what we want to hear. It's, it's a funny thing. Human psychology does that. It just reinforces our ideas of how we're doing, whether it's for good or ill. God's ways are not our ways. We need to act in accordance with the faith, of course, but even more importantly, we need to pay attention to our mistakes. And we need to pray for the grace to understand how God works in our lives. We have to go to Our Lady. She's the only one, really, who will obtain the graces for us to understand this. We have to be patient and humble. We have to keep praying and looking. God moves mysteriously very often and in ways that we don't immediately recognize. Over the course of time, though, we can develop a certain facility to recognize it. It's a good thing. He'll always surprise us. Things won't ever turn out the way we think. 
As long as we try and stay in his presence, though, and love him and beg Our Lady to obtain an understanding of the heart of her son, of the way in which he works, we'll be fine. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost.